you mention like Joe Rogan, Elon Musk, Dana White. Dana White. Pure heads of the cosmopolitan, essentially liberal movement yeah. back in the day. Including Trump himself. Playboy mansion, his whole <laughs> life, you know, growing up there. Like, he's Think not your like conservative typical dude. There's this new sexual assault allegation on Trump. And they were like, dude, they didn't care about the first 39. And the fact that he's already a convicted felon. This is not what people even care about anymore. We as humans are drawn to authenticity. Maybe not even so much to the truth. We want to know that the people we're interacting with are authentically who they are. And with Kamala, as with Hillary at some level, people would often feel like they lacked authenticity. Now with Trump, he's authentically an idiot. Hmm. But he's authentic about it. You know, he might be wrong, but he's not lying. Welcome everyone to another episode of The Overcorrection. We have an emergency podcast today. <laughs> the supreme leader of the free world, Donald J. Trump is back. Yeah. And he is going to make America hate again. Absolutely. Oh boy, they are going to start hating on everything. Yeah, to be honest, it's, I think, pretty disappointing, but also shocking, right? You've seen him, they have likely going to win the House, but uh, presidential election, the Senate... Uh, and the popular vote, by the way, if I'm not mistaken, it's the first time a Republican has won the popular vote in several elections. So it's massive. It shows a massive change in what I think American voters are thinking. Yeah, I also think that even though they've won the popular vote, given that the left is so much more active on social media, you're still going to get this impression that more people are upset about it than they are. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, especially, yeah, I think globally, right, that was one of the funniest uh, tweets I saw today, uh, which was going to say, you know, happy election day uh, or happy US election day to everybody in South Bombay and South Delhi because they're so completely invested in American elections. And this guy tweeted like, everybody, Pennsylvania elections are starting in 29 minutes. And someone commented, shut up, Arun, you live in Pune. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but it just goes to show how uh, culturally relevant America still continues to be, you know, the US election is considered like an election for the world uh, always, although that's something I start to increasingly disagree with, but um, it's relevant. Um, and to call a spade a spade and to be a gentleman as far as making predictions go, I predicted that Kamala Harris would win, so I have to go on record and say that I got it wrong. Uh, clearly, I'm not watching enough Joe Rogan and following enough Elon Musk on X or whatever the hell it's called now. So, yeah, that's, that's on me. Yeah, on that point, isn't it crazy? Like, you were saying how the left in the US especially needs to look at what they've done and created of their party, that they would, people would vote for Donald Trump. Yeah. And the irony is that you mentioned, like, Joe Rogan, Elon Musk. These are people... Dana who, White. Dana White. Spearheads of the cosmopolitan, essentially liberal movement yeah. back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, including Trump himself, who was a long-time, like, cosmopolitan New Yorker, right? He's he, just playing the game. He's been at like the, what is that, Playboy mansion his whole <laughs> life, you know, growing up there, like, he's think, not your like conservative typical dude. Yeah, but he's just capitalizing on, I think, a very deep fissure, I think, in American society. Mm. Uh, like you said, it's making people hate, it's making people be afraid of their neighbors, of each other, uh, of immigrants. Um, and I think like this election, obviously, the biggest change you've seen is actually in the Latino population. Right, which mm. shows you how much that kind of rhetoric has played in. Um, and it also brings to the fore that, look, to have a reasonable fear against illegal immigration versus normal legal immigration and refugee policy and things like that are two completely different things. But all that to say, clearly, that level of fear-mongering has again worked. Mm. Right? And, and that's the sad thing, is that I feel like a lot of times the Republicans and that MAGA rhetoric is one of like fear and super division, you know. Yeah, they said like the two big issues on either side that they were like attacking each other on, immigration against the Democrats and well, women's reproductive rights against yeah. the conservatives. And it looks like this one won this time. Yeah, and that I think is the scariest thing. And again, goes without saying for all the people that continue to lecture other countries, especially from the West. Yeah, you, you just looked at a country that essentially gave the popular vote to a person who, again, he has said that he just wants to give the devolve the power to the states on, on abortion rights, but broadly not been as proactive a supporter of Roe v. Wade as, as I think a country as progressive as the U.S. should be, right? So, yeah, it's a dark time, I yeah. think. And luckily, we don't have that level of division here. I no, think. no, I don't think so. On certain issues, it's like not really even a discussion. Mm. You know, it's always been like that. So, MTP was launched in, it was passed in 2021, right? So since then, it's, it doesn't even really feature on the ballot discussion, <laughs> right, in India. There's like so many other things that usually come up. Uh, but I do think 
what I have noticed, at least in the last few hours, just analyzing what a lot of the talking heads are saying on, uh, I love seeing both, you know, going on CNN, MSNBC, mm. as well as Fox and, and all these things, and just seeing what they're saying. Once again, unfortunately, I think a lot on the left, much to their own discredit, are not doing the kind of introspection that they should be doing, right? So a lot of conversations like, oh, I guess this has shown that half of America is racist, sexist, mis uh, misogynistic, uh, transphobic, uh, xenophobic. So all the ists and phobics. And clearly the election has shown that, look, communities don't like you just going out and labeling them in such a way just off the bat, right? And if again, after losing an election like this, that is the first thing you go to mm -hmm. instead of understanding, hey, why is it that we are losing young voters in Rust Belt states? Did why? we not yeah. get enough immigrants to vote for us? Yeah, or, or <laughs> why, oh, are now immigrants now other racist, xenophobic people? Because why would then Latino immigrants go and vote for Trump, mm. <laughs> right? So instead of actually going to the ground level and understanding, look, why are so many blue collar workers in the Rust Belt disenfranchised with some of the democratic policies or the way that they've approached conversations around economics or, or social mm. uh, uh, social politics or economics, right? But instead of doing that, it's just like, yeah, half the country is racist and I need a mental health day tomorrow because I'm sad, right? And that's just not a mature response, I think, to an election of a country that important, mm. right? When, when you should be as a party going back and understanding, look, we didn't perhaps give Joe Biden the indication to drop out of the race when he should have and nominated someone like Kamala who clearly did not have that kind of resonance with a lot of the voters. By the way, she's come in with more money also, almost I think a billion dollars. Mm. More money than what Trump had put in. Right? So all these missteps, frankly, they have made the Democratic Party seem like a party of like the elites and the billionaires and things like that. When actually the Republicans have been supported by billionaires for the longest time including mm. our infamous Elon Musk, right? So they're just way off. They need to really introspect and understand what the hell has gone wrong. And, and again, like labeling half your people as just idiots and racist is just never going to work, electorally at least. Do you think uh, Trump has a good team behind him? Yeah. Like, do you think he's just the guy they needed to get <laughs> the party voted? and then other people can actually enact change. Like J.D. Vance, have you seen his Yeah, like I've, you know, I've read parts of Hillbilly Elegy, which he wrote. He's obviously a good writer. Um, and a lot of other people as well. So I do think there's an element of, it's an overcorrection on both sides, right? Like in, in truest form to our podcast, like people think that he is worse than he is. Hmm. And people also think that he's smarter than he is. Hmm. I think like any other politician, he's just calculative. Surround yourself with the right people who can tell you the right things. Clearly, he's had an incredible team that said, go on Flagrant Podcast, go on Joe's show, do these things. He's done that in the last two weeks and has resulted in massive dividends. Kamala Harris didn't go on Joe Rogan's podcast. And can you believe something like that is now swinging an election? Yeah. So you're like convincing on-the-fence voters. Because on-the-fence voters are saying, look, I don't want a preset, here's the questionnaire interview on MSNBC or Fox News for that matter. I want him to come on, say, flagrant, where Andrew Schultz can literally say, hey, Barron's like this hot kid in New York, like, is this really the best time to overturn Roe v. Wade, right? He's joking around with the president, right? Like, that's something you cannot imagine, yeah. like, Anderson Cooper saying to a leader, because it's so, um, uh, you know, sterile, the way they interview leaders. Mm. And now, obviously, people want a more true-to-form yeah. engagement with the people that they vote for. Obama would have been great. Yeah, yeah. In fact, someone was saying something interesting. He's like, this is the most invested any leader has been in elections since they've moved out, which is the Obamas, right? They've been consistently involved, um, including in this one, like actively campaigning, mm. things like that. So clearly people, I think, miss Obama. I don't know what Obama would have been like if podcasts and things were as big as they were electorally when he was running mm. then. Um, but yeah, I think unfortunately for me, which is, you know, I was talking to my family about the same thing. I just don't think, I think Trump for me lacks a certain moral character to be the leader of the free world. So apparently like it, that doesn't even matter anymore because like two weeks ago, someone was like breaking the news. Like there's this new sexual assault allegation on Trump and they were like, dude, they didn't care about the first 39. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that he's already a convicted felon. Yeah. Like right? this is not what people even care about anymore. Yeah. And I think that's the sad part. See a lot of, again, like the 
which is where I think in some of your alternative media forms, a lot of the discussion was happening is that, you know, is this some kind of witch hunt against Trump, right? If this was mm. being done in any other country, say in India, which we would definitely get lectured for, like if you're actively trying to find a way to arrest the opposition leader who survived two assassinate, like, can you imagine that headline? Like, opposition leader who survived two assassination attempts wins a clean sweep election in a contro wins a controversial clean sweep election in the US. Like that's such a crazy headline, yeah. right? For any other country to have. So a lot of people are saying, look, did they kind of unfairly target Trump just to ensure that it was a kind of a never Trump scenario, like throwing the entire weight of the legal world, all the money you could to try and basically catch him on these mm. um, convictions. But from my point is that to, if there are convictions for him to be caught on, Clearly, that shows <laughs> that he is he lacks that uh, desire to live a, a a good, clean, ethical, lawful life. I think right? it's even worse than that because it means the population has lost the desire to be led by someone who lives a good, clean, ethical Correct. life. Correct. Correct. You know, we've spoken about this a lot, maybe on the podcast or in general. I really believe this is something interesting. Actually, with with, with uh, again. Vivek Bhaskar and shout out. It's something that we'd always talk about in, in sales, actually, in business. Is the idea that, look, there's a huge difference between truth and authenticity, mm. right? So more often than not, we as humans are drawn to authenticity. Maybe not even so much to the truth. We want to know that the people we're interacting with are authentically who they are, mm. right? And with Kamala, as with Hillary at some level, people would, always, people would often feel like they lacked authenticity. Now with Trump, he's authentically an idiot. <laughs> But he's authentic about it, is what people feel, right? Or he's authentically saying what he wants to and calls it out. So maybe people are craving more and more that, even uh, like while sacrificing truth yeah. at the altar of that, which is the sad part. You know, he might be wrong, but he's not lying. Yeah, yeah right? Like he, he calls it like it is and things like that. So I, I don't know, but I think America needs to find a way out of this. They have to heal now. I mean, Trump said on the speech, he actually said a couple of interesting things, mm. which I was pretty surprised that he would say. I don't know if people caught on it as well with all the hysteria, but he said like, you know, we're going to heal the country, which again, that's like rhetoric. I don't think I've ever seen him use. He actively even said like Muslim Americans, for example, like including them in all of this. So again, he said a couple of things that people I don't think would have even expected him to say. Um, but I think <laughs> domestically, unfortunately, I think you're going to get more of the same from him. Mm. Um, but now that's America's problem to deal with, like fight better elections. The Democrats have to look, you know, really introspect and try and understand what went wrong. The fact that you've unfortunately now set up two women to lose against someone like Donald Trump. Yeah. Like that's how much they don't want to vote for a woman of, or woman plus a woman of color. It's shocking that they'd rather vote for someone who's a convicted felon. <laughs> Again, that's not the reason why I'm sure that, that she lost the election. There's many other things. Mm. But that is a... It should be a factor, which it's not. Because there's so much other crap there. Yeah. Now, bringing things back to our show. So we actually uh, have someone here in studio with us. <laughs> and, you know, she's like, known we shoot podcasts all the time. We're not going to bring you on. Don't worry, relax. But... She lives around where we shoot. She could watch a lot of episodes if she wanted to. Yeah. We were just about to roll as she was stepping out of the door and she heard us prepping about the US election. She's like, oh, what are you talking about? And you're like, oh, just, you know, Donald Trump <laughs> and, you know, Kamala Harris. And she's like, okay, I'll stay for this. <laughs> she's still here. We are now switching to the India part of this discussion. Uh, Neha, you are free to leave if you want. I'll make this less awkward for you. We love you, Neha. Just messing with you. But, but you can stay if you give a shit. <laughs> and all about our country. <laughs> and like this video and subscribe to this fucking channel. <laughs> we'll talk more about Trump and Kamala if you want. <laughs> um, before we get to India's shows, like, even what are the impacts of this election on India, right? Mm -hmm. um, because it is important that we follow it as much as I, I, I make fun of, uh, you know, South Bombay and South Delhi being an ambassador for South Bombay myself. Uh, I do think that... Overall, the election has been fine for India. Like I said, the relationship has generally gone strength to strength. Uh, it's like a very strong bilateral between India and the US. So I don't actually foresee that changing. If anything, probably more things going our way vis-a-vis -vis if we take on, choose to take on China more or take on Pakistan more. Uh, I think Mohammed Yunus and Bangladesh is going to have some sleepless nights. Zelensky is going to have some sleepless nights. Uh, 
Netanyahu is probably very happy, which is sad. Um, but yeah, there's going to be like there are going to be a lot of ripple effects on the world. I think for India, largely, it's good. But I know we spoke about it and I do want to mention it. I think a lot of people just randomly thinking they're Hindu and therefore should align with Trump is also just a bad take. Like, I think he's the furthest thing from, like, even say if you, it, you're thinking of, like, a someone who believes in what a Sanatan way of life would espouse, he could not be further from that. Yeah. So stop buying into this alt <laughs> news. <laughs> Nexus, right? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's just weird. You find people... They are just coral or like they are conflating the fact that he has some type of national identity in America yeah. that he is espousing yeah. to the fact that, hey, we want that here. Yeah. So now he's the right guy in some yeah. weird conflated way. And I was like, you don't have to pay attention to like one small sliver of something out of context yeah. and then just attach an entire yeah. uh, emotion to it. But I also think like why maybe it resonates is that he calls a lot of things geopolitically as they are instead mm. of towing around it which a lot of leaders have done and like he made the, comments on uh, the genocide of Hindus in Bangladesh correct recently yeah I don't think he can find Bangladesh on a map <laughs> okay yeah, yeah but I think someone in his team Vivek maybe Ramas Vivek Ramaswamy I, that's my bet he's the one that told him it'll give him good like electoral gains but like for a lot of people that did probably resonate because you're the first leader in that country that has mentioned it even when like someone like Kamala even has ties and this is like not some mythical made up thing that's happening in Bangladesh. It's happening even now, right? So um, yeah, kudos to whoever his team is. But again, don't just align based on what you think is the right thing. Like read about what he's saying he's going to do. Read about the strength of his or try and understand the strength of his moral character and see if that's someone who you would like to personally align yourself with. I think that's the only thing I would say on the elections. But yeah, mm. we can move closer. Closer to home, yeah. non-US related. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so there was this uh, judgment passed by the Supreme Court, which no one is talking about. Yeah, I think like it just so happens that it like coincides with the election day. Um, but it was a big, big, uh, again, constitutional bench uh, led by uh, CGI Chandrachud that ruled... Basically, it overturned a past judgment. Um, so there was an old judgment. I'm, I'm just going to look up because I don't want to get the exact clause wrong. Um, but basically, so now the Supreme Court ruled that private properties are not automatically considered material resources of the community and cannot be acquired by the state solely for the common good. Right. So the court clarified that while Article 39B allows for the distribution of resources, it doesn't grant the state unlimited power to seize private property. Now, again, as it, to be in 2024 and even imagine that the law before this actually allowed for this is kind of crazy. Uh, but, you know, we, we did have, we did adopt for a largely socialistic economic model, Right, and and I think that also then tied into how the judiciary would rule on judgments and things like that. A model we always defend. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we this judgment doesn't change the fact that we still launch some of the most large-scale socialist schemes in the world. But I do think it shows that there's a fundamental shift judicially that now protects private property more than ev than ever before. Right, like it's a law that you would expect. Uh, country that is integrated into a largely capitalistic economic society to have, right? The right to have your private property without it being seized for community good, without there being adequate justification on whether there will actually be community good. Or work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a, <laughs> yeah, that's a whole other conversation, which, uh, you know, which we probably is worth many episodes once yeah. this whole thing starts shaking down. Yeah. But yeah, I think all that to say the law was... Uh, that the Supreme Court now on a constitutional bench has overwhelmingly ruled in favor to, I think, remove a law that can potentially be very regressive if you had a government that came in and tried to do some crazy things uh, in terms of like redistribution of wealth, which um, a party has spoken about in the past. I'm not going to take any names. but And it's not the Communist Party. <laughs> yeah, it's not the Communist Party <laughs> of, all, of all. So, yeah, I think... Um, it's a good judgment overall. And, and I think like CGI Chandrachud now having, he'll be moving on. I think he's led a pretty interesting yeah. tenure at the Supreme Court. Hey guys, Neha stayed because it was about private property. <laughs> <laughs> Shalom, bye. bye. So yeah, man, it's been a crazy week, I guess. And we'll see how this uh, election plays out. Yeah. I, I, I'd like I, to wait a little longer for a 
Indian American president. Yeah. <laughs> but JD Vance has an Indian wife. I didn't even know that. Yeah, Indian wife. Uh so I guess there's an Indian in the highest office after all now. So but yeah, I think uh, like I'm obviously not too thrilled that mm. Trump won. Uh even more so that I got a prediction wrong. That always hurts. Uh <laughs> tell me uh there is some other election coming up though. I heard about someone's been talking about an election yeah yeah you know i've been so caught up in this election that actually i have no stake in the game and i forgot that there's one happening in my state yeah. <laughs> i heard something on november 20th and i was like oh they changed the date of the us presidential election <laughs> okay <laughs> makes sense yeah, so give me I, more time to read about all the candidates yeah but i mean all, but it wasn't that yeah no massive maharashtra election coming up uh i think again it's going to be a very critical one because this has always been a battleground state and i think you're going to have um you know june 4th still fresh for the bjp but then they've already come up with some big wins after that um but maharashtra is always confusing game so very interesting politics going to be at play so let's see i i really wonder how this wind is going to blow so please go out and vote okay i think that's a good note to end it on guys Thank you for watching this episode. Please like this video, subscribe to the channel. This is the overcorrection. We're out.